hit the, hit the record button. Okay, okay, let's get let's get going. Jazz, how are you doing today? Doing great. How are you? Doing pretty good. I'm in Japan and you're still in dry Arizona, right? Yes, sir. It's beautiful right All right. now. It is very beautiful. All right, so what do you have for us today? I don't know, man. I, I was kind of going to ask you how you want to handle this. I mean, I, hopefully I'd want this to just be more of a discussion-based thing. It's just two Definitely. members of the church trying to figure out what the facts are, how do we deal with them, what are they not, what are the things in question. Um, I'm by no means an expert or a historian by any means. Right. This isn't my primary cup of tea, even though it is an interesting story to delve into. This The Mormonism has a very fascinating, if you're into murder mystery, if you're into detective, if you're into mystical, transcendental experience, it's got all aspects to it with our history because there's been so much records kept. Whether those records are firsthand, altered, or edited is something that has recently been open to us as members because of the Joseph Smith papers, which is, I'm very thankful Oh, to the church absolutely. for doing that. Yeah. There's a, Right. there's a lot of reasons why they could have kept that, you know, on the shelves, but for some reason there seems to be a renaissance happening with uh, the release of these Joseph Smith papers for members Sure. to really open up these sources themselves and say, Hey, let's try and figure out this mess that we've kind of created. You know, there's so many beautiful things that have come from these faith uplifting stories and, you know, how do we faithfully acknowledge our faith story without disrespecting our heritage at the same time? And, but ultimately I think it'd be a disrespect for us not to critically analyze human nature at work and seeing how we can avoid potential issues in the future by learning from the mistakes of the past. So. Mm -hmm. absolutely and so we're talking about polygamy and how that's just one giant mess that we're like we in the modern church are like how do we deal with this this is just like so crazy and so far out there and so like growing up as a member of the church it was sort of like a thing that like yeah joseph smith was a polygamist so like I guess, deal with it, I guess. But then I started hearing this movement about like people saying, no, he actually, what Joseph Smith wasn't a polygamist. And that was, that was all Brigham Young's idea. So do you want to delve a little bit more into, into that concept? Um, yeah, so it kind of gets a little bit complicated. It's kind of hard to know where to start, but I suppose where we could start is, uh, Joseph Smith was pretty much accused of polygamy as soon as he started the church. Like that was one of the first accusations thrown at him. His first supposed spiritual wife, plural wife, whatever term, you're going to see these terms used interchangeably for the longest time until about eight years after they arrive in Utah and they say, Hey, We have section 132. It's been kept secret. We have a copy of a copy because Emma Smith burned the original, but I kept it in my desk across the plains in a lock drawer. And we're here to tell you that this is the, the truth. This is Joseph Smith's secret teachings. So the, it was eight years after they arrived in Utah. So this was after Joseph Smith's death. And uh, Orson Pratt reveals it for the first time at the Adobe Tabernacle. Um, so they had to build the first tabernacle out of mud clay from the from the desert floors and everything because they didn't have nails. They didn't have bricks. They couldn't ship this stuff because of how arduous the journey was and everything. Um, but I'm getting distracted, but so he revealed it at the Adobe tabernacle and, and there was a lot of people confused because uh, they had in their, in their scriptures in the DNC published in 1835 originally, you know, members don't know this. And this is something that members should know about in my opinion is sec. So In the original DNC, it says that in as much as in so far as this church has been charged with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we do not believe it. We teach one man and one wife unequivocally. So that's in 1835. And then a couple months after Joseph Smith was martyred, he had planned to republish that as the doctrine of the church at that time within the DNC. So there's people going across Utah or across the United States into Utah in their with in their hands. scripture that tells them that one man and one wife and as much as this church has been proved uh, uh reproved of polygamy it's false and they showed up at the adobe tabernacle and had this revealed to them somewhere in the end circle understanding that this was being practiced secret secretly among some of the saints it was a real confusing thing because we'll get back to this point earlier 
one of the main arguments that they have for Joseph Smith not talking about polygamy was it was illegal, right? In, in Illinois, in Nauvoo, wherever they were at. And so it was potentially yeah. part could lead to his downfall. So he had to do all these things in secret and everything. But Brigham Young, shortly after Joseph Smith died, brings up in a conference talk publicly in Illinois saying that he's expounding on something Paul wrote. I forget, I forget the exact expert excerpt, but he says, this is not talking about Joseph Smith's spiritual wifery system. What is it? What is that? What is the spiritual wifery system that he's referring to? And he's, ref he's talking about this publicly after Joseph Smith died, whenever they said that this was something that shouldn't be said at all. And so you see, as soon as Joseph Smith dies, a huge uptick in quotes going back and forth, but Orson Pratt was saying he was monogamous um, like three years after Joseph Smith died still, and he already had four wives, and he admits that. So we come in this huge mess where we have all these leaders, they admit that they lied about this topic. It's hard of a thing to come to terms with that. Brigham Young said, I'm a monogamous, all throughout his years with Joseph Smith publicly said amen to Joseph Smith saying that we do not teach these doctrines and everything. Um, and then he said, well, no, we had to hide it at that time after they were safe and secure in Utah. And so we know that their testimony has some shaky ground in the past, but we don't know if Joseph Smith's testimony is on the same ground as they are or not. So either Joseph Smith was lying for the sake of preserving this pure document or this pure revelation, or he was telling the truth. And so that's, you get into this big confluence. You look at the first wife back to the, where we started, Fanny Alger. Um, we're seeing some edits going on. I forget, I forget the exact, uh, I think it was this, a descendant or whoever had the recording of, uh, there was a nasty scrape in the barn with Joseph Smith was the original word written. And then years later by a descendant, scrape was crossed out and put with uh, what a nasty affair with Joseph Smith. So that word was that changed was a, entirely. That was a scrape in the barn? There was a na the nasty scrape with Joseph and uh, her and the Fanny Elger in the barn. Okay. And that was the original word. And then that was crossed out and then turned to affair. And that was one of the first plural wives that they said that he had, so, or at least historians claim. I don't know if Brigham Young claimed that she was a plural wife, but historians say Fanny Alger was his first mm -hmm. uh, polygamous wife. And that brings up all kinds of faith crises with people through in the church. People won't even look at it. We get accusations all the time about your leaders, just like Muhammad, da, 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 da. no shame to Muhammad mm -hmm. either. But I'm right. just saying. Muhammad was a polygamist, is, wasn't he? It was. Yeah. And so that we get com compared, we get uh, called white Islam, you know, a lot or American mm -hmm. Islam or whatever. And because of these traditions we've been taught were done a certain way. Um, but you kind of look into it and there's, there is a motive for the leadership that was in position practicing these, these teachings. And we have on record uh, Brigham Young saying that he first received a revelation on the principle of polygamy while he was a missionary in England before Joseph Smith came out publicly with it. And so that's an interesting thing for Brigham Young to say that he already knew that polygamy was true before Joseph Smith even taught it publicly while he was in England. And um, mm -hmm. you had a lot of these leaders mission missionarying out to different cults in America that were rising with this, uh, Burnover District and everything that we hear about that was coming with the Second Great Awakening and everything. A lot of religious movements happening in America at that time. And uh, they were practicing some of these concepts of spiritual wifery, wife swapping, because this was their interpretation of sharing all things in common. Very disturbing interpretation, even from our perspective. And so they say, hey, we're restorationists too. We think the Book of Mormon's true. But look, this is what we know. And so you had Brigham Young going to the Concordance, you had Pratt talking to all these people and all these other locations. Um, and that's the thing, Brigham Young and Pratt, they have very enlightening, very, I feel like they've said very inspired things, but they're human. And so here's the thing, right. you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a Pratt fan. And so yeah. like, I, I, you learn some of these discrepancies that are occurring Absolutely. and uh, it, it's like, oh man. So either, so Emma Smith, Joseph Smith, Lucy Smith, they all said that Joseph Smith did not practice the polygamy that Brigham Young practiced. 
Lucy Smith, I don't know the whole accuracy of this quote. I did a little bit of research before this interview. Um, she said that she had been persuaded that Joseph Smith may have been practicing polygamy near the end of his life, but he would rep he'd repented of it. I don't know. I think that was like an interview. So interview mm -hmm. question and response. So I don't know. It wasn't firsthand or anything. But I know with Emma Smith, Smith, it was with her interview with her son, right? Uh, yes, wherever she, she out, outright uh, denied it. But there's even earlier cases wherever she said that Brigham Young had commandeered the church and uh, instituted his own law. But nevertheless, we know for a fact that Joseph Smith didn't practice what Brigham Young practiced. Can we agree on that? Like, I know you're, you don't have a neutral or positive position, but like Joseph Smith didn't have any kids with any of his 15, 20, 30, 45, depending on which historian that you talk to. And we sure. get a lot of, a lot of the facts on that seem very, seem very vague. It's like everybody that came out to claim that they were a child or a descendant of Joseph Smith's plural wives ended up being false. And it's like, uh, right. So it's it, but at the same time, there also could be there are also documents of people claiming that they had sexual affairs with Joseph Smith and had children, and so it it definitely seems like it's a big mixing bowl of. I'm not sure how to take it exactly, but it definitely right. like birth control wasn't a, really a thing back then, or at least not as much as it is now, yeah. and so the fact that we don't have any definitive idea if joseph smith did have children by plural wives definitely could have suggested either he just wasn't very sexually active with them or yeah. he just plain didn't have any other wives besides emma right yeah and so there's this dichotomy where it's like joseph smith went to the relief society with emma smith and had multiple classes because he was giving a lecture with emma and saying anyone that teaches polygamy you need to tell us and you need to, and anyone that says that they're teaching it in the name of me is a, is not telling the truth. And so they had multiple sessions. So pretty much every single woman in Nauvoo from the Relief Society, who later revealed that they were practicing it in secret and denying it in public, apparently, because Joseph Smith really wanted to make this clear. And so this is one of the things that bothers me. And what mm -hmm. we need is humility and honesty in the situation, because in Saints, that was uh, published a couple years back, and the church endorsed the um the official narrative or endorsed narrative of church history that they kind of put on the gospel library app and everything um it says joseph smith never made a public claim about um polygamy or monogamy in that history uh -huh. and there's literally dozens and dozens he published it in the times and seasons we excommunicated this individual for uh teaching false doctrine of, of the plurality of wives Anyone that claims Hiram Smith, if an angel were to come to you and tell you that uh, polygamy was true, look at his feet. He'd probably have cloven hoofs at the bottom of him. And uh, the book. This, this was all in the times and seasons. Uh, this current quote from Hiram Smith that I'm saying, no, but the about excommunicating for people teaching the false doctrine of polygamy. Yes, it was published. Yeah, affidavit right. signed and everything by Hiram and Joseph Smith. Um, but the one I'm is a uh, secondhand. He's recalling a speech from Joseph Smith, or he's or from Hiram Smith, and he's I don't know when he recorded it, but it's an interesting detail for him to say. Hiram Smith said that the Book of Mormon is the clearest text that we have against the doctrine of polygamy. It, it's even more clear than the Bible. And uh, if an angel, even if an angel were to come to you and tell you that to practice this, you could sit, you could look at his feet and see that it's cloven, pretty much, uh, pretty much implying that it's a uh, angel of the devil it's a you got a goat angel going on right and so uh you're seeing these statements and you're going this is putting us in a really precarious situation so i'm a convert i converted to this mm -hmm. religion um I, you you learn to trust in the testimony of the founder of your religion and then you start diving into the details of the history and you're going am i, am I part of a church mm -hmm. that tells us believe the testimony of Joseph Smith on all these very important things. And on this also very important things, Brigham Young said this was required for you to reach the highest degrees of celestial glory was for you to have multiple wives. So this is a pretty important topic. We shouldn't just like shrug it off. Like either Brigham Young, we can acknowledge that he got the blacks and the priesthood wrong because Joseph Smith taught, you know, did elsewise. We could teach that Adam God is a misconception of what was trying to be communicated 
we can acknowledge blood atonement. I'm starting to think that Adam God was is possible now, but anyway. <laughs> no, no, I th I think there, there is I th a lot for of, me, of merit. For me, there's there's so many crazy things that were going around back then. They're they're very they're extremely experimental, and I think a lot of the time we don't entirely have. It's almost impossible for us to have the full picture of what was going on back then. All we have are these documents that some some say one thing, some say another thing, and we really just have to be critical and 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 really try to imagine what it is that was going on back then. Yeah. And so the question and is a lot of things where a lot of the times it's we're just misrepresenting what they said. And we need to make sure we get all the context in mind. Absolutely. So the question is, who do we believe? Do we believe Joseph mm -hmm. Smith, Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, Emma Smith, Joseph Smith III, who was alive at the time and said he would, he was old enough to be able to tell if there was constant uh, dis disputations happening in his household with his parents. Um, Lucy Mack Smith. So that's the thing. A quote often comes, uh, I forget who cites it. He reports that Joseph Smith, before he was uh, being sent to Carthage jail by a couple months, he said that polygamy will be the downfall of this church. And so this is where a lot of people oh, really, so this is where a lot of people say, see, Oh, where did, he, where did he say that? I don't remember the exact uh, individual wrote in his general journal and it's cited by fundamentalists a lot to say, well, I think he, he was teaching polygamy, but near the end, he was seeing how many problems it was causing. And so he was kind of having some doubts that, and they point to this quote, but I would say maybe this quote and the reference where he said polygamy will be the downfall of this church is he was saying those who are secretly practicing polygamy and teaching it in my name are going to lead to the downfall of our church rather than him saying, I practice polygamy and I'm repenting of it. But either way, so either way, Joseph Smith didn't want polygamy to continue on. So either he was repenting of it and he wasn't having sex with all these women and he wasn't raising up seed like the scriptures say is the only just or the supposed scriptures were given is the only justification to bring it up. Section 132 says that Emma Smith will be destroyed if she denies the principle. She lived far beyond the average age of anyone around at that time. She was like 72 or something like that whenever she died, when the average Man. age of death was 40. There could be, and, with the scriptures, there's always multiple different meanings to things. I, yeah, So, but then you see the firsthand writings of Emma Smith compared to what Brigham Young claims that she did. Brigham Young claimed that sure. she tried to poison Joseph Smith twice. And he yeah, I don't believe her. that. Right. And so it's like, that. we don't believe that part of his testimony and exaggerating that we need to call into other things too. Right. And mm -hmm. he had lots of times to edit and censor a lot of the things that he said. Um, I mean, Elzer R. Snow or whatever. Uh, it was, I think, Brigham Lorenzo Young Snow. Yeah. Uh, his wife. Who's the gal? The I can't, rem I can't remember his wife's names. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, I'm getting mixed up maybe, but, uh, one of the supposed polygamous polygamous wives was claimed to get pushed down the stairs because she was pregnant with Joseph's child by Emma Smith, and it's like yeah, I did, I did some, claims. I did that, I did some research into that, and it, it definitely seems like a false claim. Right, and so we're yeah. seeing a lot of this convoluted. It's, it, it all seemed, it all seemed like it all just seems like this weird, uh, romance, uh, novel written by some crazy lady. Like, oh, yeah, Emma Smith definitely pushed Eliza R. Snow down some stairs when she realized she was pregnant. And yeah, it just it it seems it seems a little bit too ludicrous to believe that it was a real story. And it seems completely out of character for yeah. Emma Smith. And that's the thing is you could we can observe the writings of Emma Smith. We could see the fruit of her actions. I mean, Brigham Young left her with a butt like sixty thousand dollars worth of debt, which was a lot back then. And then a whole oh, bunch dang. of other of mess over there left her with all that stuff to deal with for the rest of her life, trying to pay that stuff off while Brigham Young went over to Utah. And there's a lot of question like Mark Twain, even he, he said the Book of Mormon would be a pamphlet if you took out of the, took out, um, it came to pass, right? And so he pretty mm -hmm. much was disregarding the credibility of the Book of Mormon. But even he saw Joseph Smith as an honest man and said that he believed that he never taught uh, polygamy and that Brigham Young had uh, corrupted his teachings and commandeered the church like this is mark twain he has got no stake but he observed the behavior of joseph smith and the things that were going around him the things that he was publishing in the times 
And he saw all that change after Brigham Young came in. Like, was, was he able to actually personally meet Joseph Smith or you just saw what he That's was That's a good writing? question. I think he was just observing the uh, the religion in general from a, an inch. That would be an interesting thing to find out. I don't think he ever did. Probably not. Or we would have heard mm-hmm. more about it. But he did write on about, write about Joseph Smith and the movement. Um, and so there's a lot of question on whether Brigham Young might have potentially set the Nauvoo Temple on fire for uh, insurance money. Um, really you you think Brigham Young did that so there's a kind of an interesting story with that so the question is was the Nauvoo temple ever finished that's one of the big questions that we have to contend with right because in the DNC it says that we have I mean in the in the in the painting it certainly looks like they finished it and then set it on fire (laughs) so on the facade right the facade the the interior the interior was was what was most important um Joseph Smith said that he had revealed to him and there was all kinds of discussion about him wanting windows to be a certain dimensions and it was going to make the architectural um, attempt at it far more difficult with these windows. And he says, no, they got to be this big. They got to let an X amount of light and everything. And so there seemed to be some importance to his architectural plan that he laid forth for this temple to have the function that he was looking for it to have, because he said, if we don't finish this in time, uh, they're not going to accept us with our debt. And so that this is an interesting claim. So Brigham Young worked tirelessly to do this temple. The day that they opened it, they opened it to all those who believed that he was in authority and even those who didn't believe in this, that he was in authority because everyone was working on this temple at the time, right? So whenever he was giving a speech to everyone, the floor on the second floor literally fell like a degree of inches and people jumped out of the windows because they were so frightened for their lives and broke their arms. And they had to finish the conference talk outside of uh, outside of the temple to uh, sh- make it. And Brigham Young pretty much says, you guys are wusses for not trusting the temple and all this other stuff. Whenever it, it cracked several inches, whenever the floor almost dropped out from under them and people had broken arms, he's like, you guys are wimps, but I'm out here too with you guys. Um, and then cow, I, Young came- I, I haven't heard that story before. Right, like and like so they didn't just secure the, the foundation story. well enough, and so it just collapsed yeah. under their feet. They were rushing or just trying to do the bare minimum, and I think there's I don't know, I don't know, I can't say that for sure, but I believe there was quotes where it's like we could, we didn't have enough time to make the walls like Joseph did, so we did the partitions. Like the claim was in the red brick store, and there's claims at the red brick store wherever they said that the endowment was given to them. Um, they said there was a mur- mural painted on the red brick store up to represent like the nature scene in the endowment that was supposed to be able to take place there. And there was never a mural painted there. So there's details all being called in the question that what, what really happened? We have this pure, this is how everything happened, X, Y, Z. We're not going to mention some key details here because we don't want people to question their faith, but that sets us up for a trap whenever we do have people that have access to the internet, they bring these things up to us and we don't have the tools to deal with it. And so that's kind of my primary prerogative is one, let's just do an experiment. You could say it's biased or not as a believing Latter-day Saint. Wouldn't it be nice if Joseph was a far better character than we've been led to believe? Like, wouldn't it be nice if he, like his testimony was true. He wasn't, having all these affairs behind Emma's back supposedly and all this other stuff like if, in my opinion it's very freeing to go wow Joseph Smith may have actually been one of the holiest and highest fellows to come upon this earth instead mm-hmm. of we always say it's an excuse or we, he, a justification it's like even Joseph Smith was used by God even though he was a faulty faulty man look at some of the Old Testament prophets and everything look at David um and such but even there you look there god never commanded polygamy i mean if you want to say it's to raise up seed why didn't adam have multiple sure. wives in the scriptures well, the scriptures don't explicitly mention that but i mean there is the example yeah. of god specifically commanding abraham to take hagar uh, that never happened so god never commanded abraham to take hagar oh wait no no it was um it was sarah that wanted him to take hagar and god approved right. it wasn't it something uh, like that no i don't he never said anything about it and he never called mm. him a wife and then all the scriptures never acknowledge the son had by ishmael 
right? Yeah. Yeah, Ishmael that I think so. uh, Hagar had. Uh, they only refer to his one son with Sarah or Sarai. And, Isaac, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so it's one son, only son. They don't even acknowledge the child from this pretty much surrogate mother. There was no ceremony. Mm-hmm. Was, she just said, lay with her and have a baby. That's all that happened in that story. And so you have DNC 132 citing scripture that just isn't true as well. And you have this weird voice in there. I think it's a convolution of truths that Joseph Smith taught, but then there's some insertions wherever it's like Emma Smith is going to be destroyed. If she, you know, she's a pain and she's resisting. And I don't know. I I just encourage people to really read it and compare it to the way God. It definitely seems a little bit extreme. Right. That kind of language. Right. And it's a, co- it's a copy of a copy that was found in a desk drawer years and years after Joseph Smith died. And you guys just need to trust this, even though your scriptures explicitly say the opposite of what this is saying. Mm-hmm. Like what a precarious situation. And so a lot of people come to me and they say, Brigham Young needed to be where he was to make sure that the church survived into the future. I mean, it is what it is. History is what it is. And I do think that they've effectively flooded the world with the book of Mormon. Yes. I think, I think That's God good. is able to use any kind of tool that he has, even if it's this, even if it ends up leading to lots of crazy stuff. Well, here we are, right? We're, we're trying like, to straighten it out. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of like, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but I kind of want another Brigham Young prophet, somebody who's very hard and somebody who's all about fire and fury. And I kind of think we've gotten a little bit weak, but that's, in our current state, but that's a little, that's another topic altogether. Um, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think there was, they just don't compare. Like even Brigham Young right. said, I am not like Hiram and Joseph Smith. Um, when it comes sure. to being prophets, he said, I'm a Yankee guesser. And so over mm. time, this kind of this humility that Brigham Young was portraying in the beginning kind of turned into more, I'm going to make this happen one way or another American industrialism kind of attitude and we're going to grind and people are going to starve, but it's all for the sake of the kingdom of God and all this stuff. But I mean, Joseph Smith didn't even want to go to Utah. He was looking at moving to Washington. Imagine how different things would have been if Brigham Young would have gone to Washington and how much more resources they could have had and access to the Bay and everything. If they would have gone to Washington, like Joseph said, he had to take us into a desert. Who did? Brigham Young. Right. Because he was he supposed did not, to be the American Moses. He, he, right? he did not, when he when he got to the valley, he did not say, this is the place. He said, this is the place? <laughs> right. And so that's the claim. <laughs> and then uh, you have the, the dowsing rods to find the aquifer. I, I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like it, though, if Joseph Smith did take everybody to Washington, D.C., then they, he would just be leading them further into the lion's den. Not Washington, D.C., Washington State is where he was looking. Or, was oh, Washington State. State. Okay. Yeah, Forgive that's what me. I was saying, it's, the, the, the coastline confusing. and everything, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he should have gone all the way uh, instead of stopping in Utah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of things whenever you hear, you know, I think it's just one more thing that we say Brigham Young got wrong and we put an asterisk next to 132. Like, it seems pretty clear that Joseph Smith did, did teach the uh, principles of eternal marriage. It's just, sure. One thing I think is interesting yeah. about a lot of a lot of people that are coming out with the, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, dang it, I forgot his name, Joseph something. Oh, just Joseph Lisbeth, I think his name was. He was one of the, one of the guys who doesn't believe in polygamy also, but he also to a certain extent doesn't believe in eternal marriage because it's like, oh, we just need to throw out the whole section 132, but that's sort of yeah. throwing the baby out with the bathwater because there are other clear examples of Joseph Smith teaching plural or not plural marriage, uh, celestial marriage at least. So that might that might have been what was going on is there was some confusion with uh, Joseph Smith teaching ceilings. And then it got interpreted through all these other uh, teachers' lenses, and they received private revelation they felt on it. And uh, they kind of felt threatened whenever Joseph Smith was saying he was going to crack down on this and was going to reveal to the public people that were practicing this. Who knows? Um, But whenever it comes to – I kind of lost where I was going with that. But Hmm. I think when it comes to this – 
it would be so much easier because to make the case for sealing because there is actual scriptural arguments for it. For instance, um, Adam Neither and is the Eve, man without the woman. Right. Adam and <laughs> Eve were created yeah. in the image of God. He and them. Right. right? So that implies that there is a masculine and feminine feminine and there are there, and there are clear examples throughout the bible like maybe not super direct of yeah yeah there's definitely a heavenly mother right and so i've been going down that rabbit hole really i don't know if you want to go down that rabbit hole in this podcast but uh i do think we have a good idea who heavenly mother actually is from scripture i think we actually have sure. a name well that's person. that's i mean asherah yeah. but that's another we already talked we can talk about that on another well, podcast. Well, Let's stick who, with the topic. Yeah, yeah. At so, that hand. So, in terms of eternal marriage, I guess you can relate it back to. So, in at Adam and Eve were originally created to be immortal and married. Therefore, marriage in its original design was meant to last into the eternities, right? And mm-hmm. so, if we're going to restore back to the Edenic age, the paradisical age on Earth, then we need to restore that original spiritual ceiling that was present before the fall. So there, that's an argument. Right. Makes sense. Can be scripturally held up, um, but yeah, we'll, we won't go down the Mary, mother of Jesus, being the divine mother. In this talk, we'll touch that in another one. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think there's a spiritual case to be made for divine ceiling. So I think their temples can still be seen as holy, as functional, even though you know some of the things have changed in terms of the endowment. I do know people who have. Um, said yeah i've had it be a successful mechanism for uh, allowing me to ascend the mountain and to have visionary experiences not saying that's a requirement or to have higher understandings um but i do think this is a, a shadow this is a cloud that's over the people of this this voice in the back of their head saying am i just going to be a part of some man's like spiritual harem that's going to have to be quiet in, in the background and watch my you know husband be a god or am i going to be yoked with his yoke one flesh you know like joseph Mm -hmm. smith seemed to teach the whole time that one man and one woman unless in the case of death that was the teaching right sure so i think there might have been some confusion whenever they brought up questions about hiram smith if he was getting sealed and uh getting sealed to his deceased wife maybe there was some miscommunications with how that was being interpreted and saying if well i definitely i definitely don't see if you if i don't see a problem with that in general that like if you're if you had a wife that passed away and then you're just now learning you have another wife and you're just now learning about eternal marriage it it kind of makes you wonder okay well which wife do i choose mm-hmm. if you're if you're supposed to be monogamous in heaven yeah and so that's that's the thing so, so it, if you it, open it, up it that door like, then you yeah. could have open up the door mm-hmm. of having multiple husbands right in the afterlife and that's where we get the polygamist saying well our love is going to be different in the afterlife and it's going to be a selfless love and we won't you know be caring or jealous or anything like that it gets into murky water i don't know how to deal with that stuff honestly but i do think mm-hmm. that there's promises that could be made in time that will last into eternity um promises and vows made between you and god but I don't know. I don't know how that works, but yeah, I mean, we come with the conundrums, like even right now, like my mom, for instance, she's not uh, married, but she's divorced from my dad and she can't get be sealed to me, you know, as a family, because there's no, well, you would, you would be sealed to her as your son, not as, you know, not in a marriage type of ceiling. Yeah. But so that, like, I'm I just, think... I'm just giving an instance of where we get into, like, we already are dealing with these murky issues. And so it's like, mm-hmm using polygamy is just like well look how else would you there's more righteous women in heaven than there are men duh like come on i don't i don't believe i don't i don't believe that right i don't i think and so i think i think ultimately yeah marriage is super weird right can be super complicated when you think of the eternal perspective but i i like to think that everything works out in the end lots of people think oh we're gonna certain people are never going to be able to see their loved ones ever again, because we're going to be separated by kingdoms. And it's like, that's, where is that written? That's not Mm -hmm. written anywhere. You can, it's like, I don't, I think everybody's going to have the, uh, the opportunity to be sealed to who they want to be in the afterlife. So it's like, you're not, you're not just fixed. It's not against your free will. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's, that doesn't sound like something God would do. Right. 
Okay. So I we're running low on time here. So I got to pause it and then send you a new Zoom link. Is that all right? Yeah, then we can sure. continue the conversation. All right. Yeah. And record. We're back. Yes. Well, okay. I'll just splice it all together. So it looks like we never left. Okay. So let's, I want to, let's bring up a couple of, in, a couple of things. So, well, first I want to, I want to backtrack real quick. You mentioned that Brigham Young may have been responsible for the Nauvoo Temple fire. Yeah. So uh, that's like some kind of tax write off. Or... Uh, so he had insurance on it. And then there was kind of an interesting claim he made once he was in Utah later on. And he was kind of making fun of businesses that had a uh, insurance on their, on their buildings. And he said, the only people that buy insurance for their buildings are arsonists uh, and tax frauds or, or insurance frauds. And uh, it's kind of funny that he, one of the few things that he did was put insurance on the Nauvoo temple. And then shortly after it burned down. So if it wasn't done, if they didn't want other church members to have it, you know, I don't know. There's some other interesting stuff that happened with it too. So let's say he burnt it down. Then the remnants of the temple were sold to a Protestant branch for them to start their church in, right? And as they were working on reconstructing it, a tornado came through and destroyed the rest of it. So apparently there was something going on, rather whether it was lit on fire by someone else, struck by lightning, and that's why I caught on fire. I don't think I don't think there's any reports of any rain or anything. But you get what I'm saying is it's like, all right, nope, we're not even gonna let the outside of this temple stay around we're going to destroy the rest of it with the tornado so mm -hmm. yeah so uh, you take either, that uh, either, no either brigham young or god himself wanted that temple destroyed with the <laughs> tornado or the fire or the yep anything yeah so, so but that that's an interesting thing so but anyway so let's so but like concerning the the document itself section 132 yeah it they talk about it being a document, a copy of a copy of a copy, kind of like what we have with the gospels. It's just a, it's a copy of a copy of a copy. We don't have the original. We don't Brigham, know if Brigham, Brigham Emma, Young claimed that right. Emma, bur Emma burnt the original, right? Sure. Right. Along with like, that, she poisoned Joseph Smith and she sure. did this and she did this out. Which, thing. which all, all those things seem super out of character, but right. the question is, where did it come from? Like, did, yeah. Brigham Young write it, did one of the others write it and then try to claim that it came from Joseph Smith? Yeah. I wish I, I wish I had the kind of brain where I remembered all the names. Um, but you that's pretty readily available. If you do Google it, you could see whose handwriting um section 132 is. And it wasn't any direct scribe, but supposedly the claim is that Brigham or Joseph Smith was wise enough to have this fellow there also to uh, write copy the revelation that he had had before he handed it over to Emma because Emma was saying, oh, you promised me you'd let me see that revelation. And she instantly went to the fire and burnt it whenever. Hmm. So that's the story that we have to deal with with this. And somehow sure. they just discovered it. Was, it wasn't years it, and years it after was, being I think it was that Hiram pushed Smith to rewrite it and give it to her. And then she threw it in the fire because she didn't want to see it. Right. But luckily, they had this extra copy that's totally perfect. And then there's reports of people that read. They said there was some sort of revelation going around. And this one, so whether that first that first revelation that was going around, whether it was from Joseph Smith or not, we don't know. But there were some people that said there was a revelation going around. And whenever I saw what was published in Utah, it looked nothing like what we saw originally. So there's aspects of 132 that are commented on by um what is the the newspaper place that got the expositor um and so they referenced 132 and so this is the strongest argument that fundamentalists point to to say that this was around this revelation was from joseph and being taught because there's uh references to specific statements in 132 back then in the expositor before it got burnt down i wish i knew more about the expositor i did at one time I'd have to research some more stuff, but if you have any questions on any of these topics, go to 132 Problems with Mormon Polygamy uh, with Michelle Stone. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she, she I don't agree with all of her opinions, but she's a great person. And I do think that she's trying to kind of investigate this with sincerity. Um, is, she yeah, a, can... is she like a pretty, pretty intense scholar with it all? 
Oh, you haven't heard, you haven't heard of Michelle Stone yet? Yeah, not, so she's not had... too well. No, I know about Brian Hales. That's mm-hmm. like a polit- polygamy scholar, but I'm not too familiar with this yeah. with Stone. Michelle Stone has about uh, thirty thousand subscribers now, and so she's growing in the Mormon sphere, and that's her channel. It's 132 problems with Mormon polygamy, and so she breaks it down from the scriptural perspective. Uh, she had Brian Hales on there recently, and that kind of turned into. A little bit i don't want to put words but it kind of seemed like he was implying that she was deserving of excommunication because of what she was saying um during mm-hmm. that interview and then don bradley went on there i really look up to don bradley he's kind of the preeminent scholar on uh mormon polygamy and they're having a really honest conversation on that channel so i encourage people to go over there and look at that because they're kind of sure they're kind well, of have a conversation you, you like can this. you can send me the link and i'll put it in the description yeah, for sure. And so she has a whole three-part series on the expositor and kind of looking at the background story for that. Um, so we have this huge issue. People are getting commun- excommunicated. Reputations are being ruined. Uh, divorces are happening at this time. And so this is where you get people where they get really defensive because then it comes up to, oh, was this potentially a motivation for the killing of Joseph Smith? And so you get this documentary is coming out talking about some of the yeah. it's kind of like a jfk documentary about what really happened in carthage jail that day was he potentially killed by some of his own leadership mm-hmm. because there was claims of a judas being among the leaders and everything by joseph smith yeah you mean like that yeah. one guy who tried to prove that it was an inside job and it was the other people in the room that killed joseph smith yeah justin uh, i don't yeah. know i don't i don't really buy that there's did some, you watch there it seems to be, did you watch it I, I did. I did watch it. Yeah, I, uh-huh. I, I still think there's way too many holes in the theory. Hmm. But yeah. Anyway, did you watch part two. I, I didn't realize there was a part two. Yeah, there's I just, a part two. I just, I just watched the general who killed Joseph Smith documentary, and I don't know. So, it it kind, of, it kind of seems like oh, the bullet went here, but they claimed it went here, so there must have been something going on. And yeah. It's like I, don't, I don't know. I, I think. There were there were bullets flying every which direction in that room. It really seems like so. But well, that was that a, was one in, of the main points that they case, brought up in that movie, yeah. though, is why was there no bullet holes from fifty caliber rifles on the outside bricks of this store that was being or this jail that was being bombarded with fire from everywhere? Sure, there's well, no bullet was, hole. I think it was the because they it it's not completely the original building that we have it's no the out the facade lot, there's been original. lots of there's been lots of reconstruction going on the facade is stone though and it's been original that's since that's, the very that's beginning. what i that's what i've heard is that there's been lots of reconstruction going on right but in any case i still don't i don't i don't buy the idea that it was an ins, inside job i think it was absolutely the the you know the guys that were talking about it in the bar just afterwards that they definitely were the ones responsible i mean why not let the crowd do it why why have it be an inside job it seems right. like you would be able to get away with it a lot easier but in any but in any case we're getting off topic again let's get back to the what we were talking about with the uh what were we talking about <laughs> we're talking about the section who wrote it where did it come from yeah. kind of thing yeah yeah okay yeah. So if not if not Joseph Smith, then I maybe it was the scribe that wrote it, and then yeah. when they did print it out, produce it, why point pinpoint it on Joseph Smith? Why not say it was a revelation from Brigham Young? Why try to force all this polygamy stuff on Joseph Smith? Right. Um, because that was the claims to authority that um, Brigham Young had established. So with the Temple Lot case. What happened was uh, the church that owned the temple lot, all they were trying to do was prove that um, Emma Smith's church was uh, not closest to what uh, Joseph Smith had um, established for them to retain their rights. They didn't even have to uh, to the temple lot. They just had to prove that. It was that... Joseph Smith the third's church. No, not, not the owner of the temple lots, but uh, the RLDS Emma Smith, you know, started originally and then, uh, yeah, Joseph Smith III was the one. A lot of Strangites ended up going into the RLDS church. Um, I forget the name of the Temple Lot Church. It's super small. That's still, I believe they still own it today. But anyways, back in the 1800s, they had this case on Temple Lot, and they went to Utah Mormons and said, hey, 
we need you to provide all the evidence that you have that you're closer to Joseph Smith's original church uh, than Emma and Joseph Smith the Third's uh, reorganized church. Even though that small group of Mormons believed that Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy, they said, hey, we're trying to win this case. You need to provide evidence. So they came with a slew of affidavits coming into the Temple Lock Lake case so Brigham Young could prove that he was the rightful. He said, if I win this case, you know, I'm good to go. I'm like certified even by the state. You know, even the judge agrees that I'm closer to Joseph Smith. So you get all these testimonies and affidavits that are produced, but you read the transcripts of the interviews that were going on with some of these witnesses and they just don't make sense. And they're just blatantly wrong, um, impossible. The dates don't match up wherever these things could have even happened. And even the judge said, this isn't convincing at all. And uh, said that Joseph, this is all hearsay. And so they lost that uh, part of the argument on the Temple Lock case. He said, this evidence isn't sufficient. This, is, this isn't, wouldn't be upheld in the court of law, but we have historians wanting just i want to be the one that discovers joseph smith's next wife even though it's the most obscure little little detail i want to be the one that identified a new wife for joseph smith so i could get my little dog ear and you know successful joseph smith historians but whenever you have the church endorsing statements like joseph smith never made a public claim on polygamy like that's some real issues and you're gonna have people go all right we need to have some sort of comment on this because in the least we need to acknowledge that until death, all of his public and private journals, here's another instance. Um, Joseph Smith was walking around the street with a scribe, a scribe to prove that he was a monogamous. He said, I need you to keep record of everything I'm doing to prove that really? I'm not a monogamous. And so in the journal entry, he had, he, said, had a, he had a scribe just to record and prove that he was a monogamous yeah he was recording everything that he was doing during the day because there was all these accusations flying and so in that journal it said joseph smith walked walked around the street teaching against the principle of the plurality of wives and he's uh and i forget the exact wording but he pretty much says god forbades it but he left a space in the journal entry and then there's handwriting at a different time and then you get the insertion of the 132 uh teaching uh, except declared by one man at a time on earth to who can administer the principle or whatever, something along those lines. And uh, so you keep getting, you get pages cut out in the documents. You get these weird spacing that's kept out multiple journals being kept at the same time by some of these leadership. And you're getting these additions and Joseph Smith history is told from the first person. There's like in very fine print where they acknowledge like in their first publication that, yeah, this was revised by the church historians and at the time, which was Brigham Young. So he spent years and years revising church history. What does that mean? Revising church history. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that could happen. So people read Joseph Smith history and they think this is literally the hand of Joseph Smith, but it's these historians compiling all these documents from the first person perspective. And they say, well, this was a common practice that happened back then to write from the first person while we're writing their biography and everything. But a lot of people just took it as history as joseph smith's hand they missed the fine print they didn't understand what was going on and so we're dealing with the residual patterns that have been programmed into our people saying no this is a fact we have the quotes we have this it's like no there is no contemporary evidence of joseph smith ever teaching the plurality of life of wives uh, they point to one note again i don't remember the names but i was so disturbed whenever i found out the fundamentalist interpretation of this note so Joseph and Emma Smith are being sought out by all these different actors that are trying to um, tar and feather them. Who knows? All kinds of stuff, right? So Joseph Smith had to go kind of from hideout to hideout and send these messages. So one of these messages survived, right? And it says something along the lines, I forget who it was, but, oh, how I've missed you so. Bring your daughter and I'd like to talk with you soon. And they say, and it's they turn this one phrase, I forget the exact phrase, into some sort of like, into window like bring your daughter and so we could i could like embrace her or something like that and they're like oh see polygamy he was inviting her over for a booty call and you're like dude her parents would be in the right next room and that's what you're saying that's what you're that's the only contemporary evidence that you're pointing to and at the end of it it says burn it and if you see oh this is what they point to that's what it says they said if you see emma is around know that it isn't safe and so there's a couple interpretations of that. And so that's where they say, look, it's, he didn't want Emma to know that they were meeting with this family. Um, but it was saying, 
um, if Emma was around, she was warning Joseph of some sort of oncoming danger because otherwise they would be separated. That's the interpretation we should have rather than this dark, twisted, I'm hiding this from Emma. It's no, if Emma's around, know that there's something going on because we, she wouldn't be around otherwise. And so we might need to make him escape away from, but this is the interpretation that the historians say they, this is the only, it's so strange. The fundamentalists do so much wrong, but then the historians just believe the whole narrative that they have on this topic alone, everything else, the fundamentalists get wrong, but on this topic of Joseph Smith and they get this weird mel melancholy voice where they're like, yeah, he wasn't a perfect man, but you know, he did do this stuff and it's like i'm just not convinced i'm not convinced and and even if even if he did practice it he repented of it we know he wasn't practicing what brigham young was practicing he wasn't having kids he wasn't raising up seed and it's something we need to move past and i think we so the, i brought up earlier was brigham young necessary for mormonism to get to where it was i don't know mormonism was on fire there for a second if Brigham mm -hmm. Young and company potentially had some sort of planning involved in staging of them being in certain locations while this event transpired, um, then Mormonism would have been even further because Joseph Smith would have still been alive, if that is the case. Probably, yeah. But if they wouldn't we have, didn't to have to deal with the desert heat. That too. <laughs> and so they would have been, so if they weren't practicing polygamy, they would have been able to stay in Illinois. Nauvoo was bigger than Chicago at the time. Like they were a real, they're going to, he was abolitionist running for president, first presidential candidate to ever be assassinated while running for office. And he was a, a force to be reckoned with. And so the question is, if all these, this web that we're discovering is connected to this central issue of polygamy being the thing that led to the fracturing of the church, I don't know if Brigham Young was necessarily the most positive outcome to happen from that. I think we could. So here's what happened. Emma's church, our LDS church, Joseph Smith III's church, had an identity crisis whenever the Utah historians just like, look at all these affidavits. We're going to shotgun you with all this stuff. And no one actually took the time to read the stuff in detail and question it because they had already been infiltrated by woke individuals and they were looking for any excuse for them to like not acknowledge the divine calling of Joseph Smith as it was. And so they get all this stuff, they have an identity crisis, and then they just go full blown woke. And now we see the fruits of their actions. So we don't want that. We don't want to just throw the baby out with the bathwater. But we also want to acknowledge all this tra traumatic stuff that we've been having to deal with missionaries getting bombarded by the most er erasious uh, claims about Joseph Smith practicing um all these horrible things and they've never heard about it in detail and all this stuff and what the claims are. And they're like, they'll bring up, did you know Emma Smith tried to poison Joseph Smith? Like what? I've never heard of this, but we need to hear about this stuff and we need to contend with it. And I think there, I do think there's something going on. So why else would they release these papers? Because more and more evidence seems to be coming out that there's some question to this narrative, but they seem to be having a neutral point in the saying interpret for yourself. So I, I, I don't know. I hope there's someone in there in the, the LDS leadership that is purposely relinquishing some of these documents. Um, there's a couple sources that would kind of be a deal breaker one way or not, if they are, um, it, whether Joseph Smith was a polygamist or not, but they see, they said they're going to release it. William Clayton's journal, I believe is one of them. And they said they were going to release it a couple years ago and they still haven't released it. And that seems to be the hot topic evidence that monogamists are dying at the bit to see and all of the polygamy supporters who say, oh, it doesn't really matter. But no, you don't need to look at that. Like, it's fine. It's probably fine. And so like it, the position is like, we're hungry to find out if Joseph Smith was telling the truth where the LDS church has placed its membership on this like losing end. It's like, I, I picture a tug of war. So you have the members of the church pulling, saying, don't trust Joseph Smith's testimony. And then you have behind them the Exmo and the atheist and the communist. And you got all these other people pulling in the same direction. They go, am I, am I helping them? What side am I pulling on? And you have the people over here fighting with all their might saying, we should believe Joseph Smith, Emma Smith, and Lucy Smith. And all these other individuals that stayed in Nauvoo and adjust according to the reality of the situation and not what we've been told. Because luckily we do have firsthand documents. We could see where things were potentially manipulated because of human efforts, uh, because of human pride.
because when man is given a little bit of authority, they are sure to exercise unrighteous dominion to a certain extent. And that's why we're supposed to seek the loving charity of Jesus Christ as much as possible. And if it's not true, we need not have to deal with the bondage of the concepts any longer. And I think it'd be, Wait, I think communists I, I, are pulling on the rope too. Yeah. That to not believe Joseph Smith, they don't want, they don't want the restoration to be true, <laughs> mm-hmm. but yeah, they do like, they do like the book of Mormon law of consecration. Well, it seems yeah. less about the, pl- I don't know if, the issue of polygamy would definitively prove whether or not Joseph Smith was a true prophet. I think he was definitely a very fallible guy, but let's, let's get back onto whether or not he was polygam polygamous to begin with. Yeah. What do we do with like testimonies outside of the affidavits, like Helen Mark Kimball's testimony? You'd have to get specific on the, I, I know, like I said, I'm not the best with names. It would be more content, like what sure. claim. So like Helen Mark Kimball, she was like the youngest wife of Joseph Smith. Supposedly she was 14 years old when well, she was uh, sealed to him. That's uh, Alger, right? No, this is Helen Mark Kimball. Alger was older. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I, got my, yeah. I got my Alexa. Oh, see, even, even Alexa agrees with me. So there you go. I think I think you're referring to Fanny Alger was the 14 year old because that's that's no, the that, one was, that, that was that was Helen Mark Kimball. That was definitely Helen Mark Kimball. She was the, she was the. That's the what. That's the one I was telling you about in the, yeah. in the barn. So yeah, this is no, what that was. Up. No, the family elder was the one in the barn. It was Helen yeah. Mark Kimball was another. That's one. the young one. That's where you always see depiction. That's Fanny Alger right there. Where depictions of her being super young. And they always say, "Look how young she was." That's Fanny Alger right there. Sure, but look up, look up Helen Mark Kimball. She was the fourteen-year-old wife. She was fourteen years old when she supposedly was sealed to Joseph Smith supposedly because her parents wanted her to 30 40 yeah i recognize her uh, i don't remember her being the youngest though okay well yeah. if not if You're not right. the youngest she was one of the youngest okay and she was also yeah. like one of the most vocally one of the most vocal and protect in saying that in uh in the polygamy discussion Right, but it was years and years after his death. Sure. Right. Yeah, it was years years after his death. Absolutely. And, and and she most likely was part of the relief societies that said not to believe anyone that was teaching it. And so she must have, if her testimony is true, was secretly knew that Joseph Smith was lying to everyone around her and that mm-hmm. he was actually already married to her, you know? And so this is right. the conundrum that we're putting Something in. Like so either she was being deceptive back then or she wasn't actually married to him and didn't was just going along with what was saying. And then after she was put in a situation mm-hmm. where her, her salvation or damnation was on the line because Brigham Young's claiming these things, if you don't follow the prophet and all these other things, you're going to be, I mean, he was saying that if Joseph Smith wants to see Emma, uh, he's going to have to go to hell because that's where she is. This is these are things that Brigham Young mm-hmm. was like, he was, he was a very staunch guy. And so, and you're in Utah where there's no resources, you're isolated and so when people are like, there's no evidence of G- Brigham Young being coercive towards these women to make the testimony. It's like, yeah, but you look at the, the context, it's not, the affidavits aren't in their handwriting. Uh, some of them aren't even their signatures on it. And they're just getting stamped by the courts in Utah whenever there's pretty much a theocratic king, Brigham Young being there. We got to take this stuff with a grain of salt. There's a lot, of, a lot mm-hmm. on the line, a lot of motivation for us to make these cases. And there's instances where they were already lying in Nauvoo, according to their own later claims about these topics. And so it's like we've already shown for a fact that they lie on these topics for sure. Joseph Smith is the only one that's still innocent until proven guilty, in my view. And so, in the very least, if we can't say polygamy is not, we don't, I think the humble thing for us is like I said earlier, put an asterisk next to 132 and say, it's complicated. We don't know. We should look into it further. Hopefully we could get some sort of divine revelation to sort this whole thing out. That would be ideal. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. ever going to happen, but if we were to say, thus saith the Lord on this subject, this is where we're going. That would just give a lot of clarity to the situation because here we are, the activity rates are going down no matter what the statistics that the church likes to put out about growth and everything we're going at 1.8 percent um, growth or whatever activity is what's most important and i'm seeing mm-hmm. a lot of people questioning the official narrative and 
the whole attitude right now in church is all as well in Zion, all as well as in Zion, just pay, just listen to the prophet and block out all the noise, but you can only block out that noise long, a certain amount of time. And so you got to deal with it because otherwise you're not living in the real world, you know? And so we have to become strong, not just oblivion to the circumstances, our, our awful situation as the book Mormon likes to phrase it for us. We are an awful situation. I mean, we're, we were taught by Nelson in uh, the 2010s that the church was under condemnation for not taking the Book of Mormon seriously, and he got that from the DNC. And that's kind of changed recently, but we didn't get an update why we aren't under condemnation anymore. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we were under condemnation back in the day, whenever Joseph Smith was alive, whenever he said that the church is under condemnation for not taking the Book of Mormon seriously, um, was because it... Supposedly, Hiram Smith said the strongest document mm -hmm. we have against the, do the doctrine of plural marriage is the Book of Mormon itself, wherever it in Jacob, wherever it's saying. And so there's some debate about, well, it says, except there's this loophole right here, except to raise up seed. But whenever you look into the phrasing and how that those that terminology is used elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, it doesn't line up. And it's like, it's, it's a strange interpretation. Like I, I, I saw a presentation and they changed one word and it's like, oh yeah, that fixes the whole thing. It's, whenever you look at the 18, uh, thirties usage of the word and everything, it does exclude that loophole from even being, it doesn't even make it like a minor interpretation. It's like, yeah, that doesn't make any other sense because he just has a full context of him ripping on how evil this practice is. But he's like, but if you need to, God will do it. But then you say, show me in the Bible where God has done that anywhere ever. And there's no instance where God ever commanded for any man to take another wife. And I believe in the Joseph Smith translation, he changes it uh, where David's practices was abominable in God's sight. And so even the Joseph Smith translation supports uh, down looking on the practice of polygamy. So we got DNC, we got the book of Mormon and the Joseph Smith translation seeming to support marriage is one man and one woman that's the image of god and that's what we sure. read well i so. don't know i wouldn't completely say that the church is all about all as well as zion i definitely i mean you saw of delaney jokes who comes usually comes down hard on woke culture every once in a while and you know i can't wait to see what he he'll do as president of the church but we definitely need uh I definitely think there needs to be a big, you know, overhauls going on. But in any, I still think it's the best, uh, the best thing in the world, you know. But let's let's that's a topic for another video. Let's talk about the Book of Mormon. So, mm -hmm. like, it's in Jacob. It says he comes down pretty hard on pe people saying look at the look at your the uh, he comes down on the nephites pretty hard like hey look at the lamanites they're they're practicing monogamy they're being super righteous why aren't you you know doing the same thing right and so he he sort of condemns polygamy but then he's like why why are you oh, practicing these whoredoms, sure. right? Yeah. yeah exactly why are you practicing these whoredoms and then but then something that always something that i want to talk about is like a couple of verses later it, he almost seems to give an exception to the rule like right. if i if i will i will command to my people to raise up seed then i will command it yeah and so you you, you briefly touched on that but let's get a little yeah. bit deeper into that scripture like what is it that he's talking about raising up seed that he will give a certain commandment so from what i understand a righteous seed in the context of the scripture isn't speaking of having a bunch of children. Um, it's speaking of raising up sons whom will look to their father and turn their hearts mm -hmm. to their fathers. Um, because that's what I've really been delving into is so the holy order of things, the, ho the holy order of the fathers. And so it starts with Adam, he holds all the keys, right? And then it goes down this line and, and lectures on faith say it's transferred through testimony. And so mm -hmm. I, I don't have the scripture right in front of me. We could have a Whole discussion there's something on 132 uh 132 problems with mormon polygamy she talks about that loophole in depth um but from my interpretation raising up a righteous seed that's not what he's talking about he's talking about raising up uh more members of the holy order uh, uh the more members of visionary men and women and uh 
you have to really understand the context of the Joseph Smith translation whenever he talks about these things and the righteous seed and everything. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. And I for, I wish I had the verse in front of me. Do you have it? Jacob 32, right? Or Jacob 30, something like that. Yeah, I can I can bring it up real yeah. quick. <clears throat> But, but it that's sort of a rough estimate of what it says, I think. Yeah. It's it's like one word. Yeah. So that's the one thing they point to. So yeah, if it's to raise up righteous seed, why wasn't Joseph Smith raising up righteous seed? Sure. If if your interpretation is to have many wives and do that with it, you know? And so um the except isn't even in regards to it's like that's what it is. It says except. And it's not a <clears throat> saying an exception to the rule. It it's uh the context matters. So if you could bring that up, that would help a lot. Sure. But nevertheless, okay, so I, I got the yeah. I got the scripture up here. So okay. let's see if I can share the screen. Okay, so yeah, it says right here. Uh so up here he's like he's condemning the talking about chastity of women, talk condemning polygamy and all that, talking about David and Solomon truly have any wives and concubines, which was abominable before me. And then we get down to verse 30. He says, <clears throat> for if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. Right. And so for me, that almost suggests that obey the obey the standard of one wife unless i command otherwise yeah so you gotta so for one thing here's an interesting thing so these spacings that they do with the verses can change the entire meaning of the context so if you put this into paragraph form it makes it flow so much easier for one and then mm -hmm. the punctuation isn't inspired as well the book of mormon was the longest run on sentence ever you know there was no mm -hmm. punctuation in the original and so oh, they had absolutely. the typesetter, the typesetter that had to do a lot of these these edits in the original. Joseph Smith made some edits to the uh, punctuation, but so that's very useful in a lot of these circumstances for you to try and separate the spaces, read it as one contiguous uh, format. Um, so I forget. I'd be interested to see. So he says, "For behold, I the Lord." Or he said, for if I will say it, the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, right? I will, I will command my people. So take out the punctuation for one. So are they saying that unless I command my people to not be chased, unless I command my people, I, like I said, I'm not an expert on this, but it's like, that's a weird thing. It's like, oh yeah, you'll be allowed to commit whoredoms if I allow it though. I will command my people. Otherwise they shall hearken under these things. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a strange thing, but I do, there's a whole episode. I'm not an expert on the 132, but all I know is what Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith uh, claimed about it. And uh, there was even times in the times and season where they said that the book of Mormon taught against the principle. So were they confused? Did they, did they have a right righteous interpretation of this verse? You know, um, save one wife and concubines you shall have none for i the lord delight in the chastity of women and whoredoms are an abomination to me thus says the lord of hosts mm -hmm. saith the lord of hosts accursed for their sakes yes for if i say the lord of hosts raise up seed unto me i will command my people otherwise they shall hearken unto these things yeah so raise up seed i don't know that's uh well that'll have to be something that we think about a little bit more but i i, I think need it's an interesting scripture yeah no I, and that's the main one that all the fundamentalists bring up and uh i i forget there's a whole there's a whole like hour-long presentation just about that loophole and i'm trying to forget the main point that they made about but something about the terminology and then they give examples where it says accept is used differently um and it's like i don't know We'll move on from that one. I'm not an expert on that one. But yeah, whenever sure. it comes to all the other evidence. Well, in general, it should be understood that neither of us are should be considered experts on any of this stuff. It's right. like if you want to be if you want to be very well informed, go look at the real polygamy experts. Like uh what did you say her name was? Michelle Stone. And go yes. look at go look at Brian Hells, go look at the people that have really like 
gotten their hands deep into this stuff and see what they're talking about and then yeah. make your own opinion on it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think the most worthwhile ones are whenever you're seeing the two sides mm -hmm. um, um, contend because then it's not just an echo chamber for sure. And those, so there's right. a couple of debates on uh, Hemlock Knots as well as another uh, YouTube channel. You could see some previous debates um, mm -hmm. between individuals. But yeah, you're seeing a lot of people delve into this topic. You're seeing uh, Ward Radio. Ha Ward Radio mm -hmm. did have Michelle Stone on. Um, they're having some debates. They had Don Bradley on there and she was... So there's been this weird YouTube um, dynamic going on between these creators and trying to associate or to navigate the situation because of how difficult of a topic topic it is to talk about. Um, but ultimately, mm -hmm. I think we're going to come out stronger on the other side. I think uh, definitely. And, but I think we need to give Joseph Smith a chance again. We need to give sure. him the benefit of the doubt. I mean. It's like we have a vested interest. Yeah, we should we we should try at least give him a little bit of benefit of the doubt. I mean, one of the things that Joseph Smith was wanting to do is he wanted to enforce the principles of the U.S. Constitution even more strongly, and he wanted to make requirements even more strong in the benefit of innocent until proven guilty because of how often he'd been accused of things and how often he had been jailed unrighteously and everything. Yeah, it's like, if only he had become president, you know. Right. Who knows that, where we would have been. Yeah, we probably would be a lot more ahead than we are right now. Yeah, for sure. And so, but in, in all things, my general philosophy is that the ultimate truth of things lies in between two contradictions. You got to you gotta eliminate human error, take a look at all things, right. and sort of come up with, instead of immediately saying these things contradict each other, therefore we got to choose one over the other. I think before you do that, you got to really see if there's any way they connect. And it's going to be, it's going to take a long, hard process to think, how do we connect all these things that say Joseph Smith was a polygamist and all these things that say that he wasn't? What's that, what's that one middle ground that maybe we're not, we're not completely seeing? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think there's a, con there's a big convolution of stories and narratives and people operating from a certain place of information and there were secrets going around and i think people had a lot invested um there was some talks of some i'd be greatly rewarded if i went or went along with this thing but i denied that um that temptation and stuff so they're human and whenever it comes to spiritual matters uh, i do think there is a reconciliation found in contradiction for sure but whenever it comes to historical matters um, I think there is somewhat of a place where you say, did it happen or did it not happen? Was he telling the truth mm -hmm. or was he not telling the truth? And I think whenever it comes to yeah, the testimony there was, of Joseph there Smith, yeah, when it comes to the position of Joseph Smith, like you have the Mohammedans um, defending uh, Muhammad, you know, character and morality all the way to the death. And you could say, oh, that's not fair. You know, look at all this evidence. And they would have their scholars that would provide their evidence, but they're growing. And they're, they're strong sure. and they trust that their prophet was a good, just man. And they work from that place. And, you know, I don't want people to leave the church, but I do think that they should assess this information for their, themselves. Sure. Like you were saying, well, there, there's no resources. reason to leave yeah. the church over, over these matters. I think you need to evaluate the church where it is today. And yeah, there may have been some things that we lost along the way from Joseph Smith, but it's still, I think it's still an extension of what Joseph Smith started, even if it's been a little bit diluted and it's the best church on the earth. It's the best way to accumulate all these truths and bring them, bring them in. And that's, what's really going to enrich our yeah. lives. Yeah. I mean, it brought me in, you know, I, I was sure. baptized in, in July. Okay. And, so we uh, got was... less than one minute. So hurry up and finish your thoughts before. Okay, it closes yeah. out. <laughs> no, I mean, I got baptized in July of 2017 and, uh, it's been difficult, you know, to go across all this information, but ultimately I came out believing in the testimony and in the calling of Joseph Smith now more than ever. Um, because once you do see the history, you see how good of a man he is. And I think it's made me strong. This process has made me stronger for it. And I think it'll make everyone that does delve into it more inspired and make the restoration more real than ever was before. And uh, they'll kind of have an understanding of how history works 
potentially even in early Christianity itself and see how these things can get diluted and confused. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah. And you're welcome. I, Thanks for having I me. I hope we got a lot of things to think about and,